So, welcome to this seminar on uh, the Mondragon case and cooperative economy. Um, my name is Atle Mittun. I'm a professor here at the Department of Law and Governance. And we're very happy to, uh, to have this seminar here. It's a collaboration with the University of Oslo, the Center for Development and the Environment, and more specifically, the RNNS program, which is chaired by Professor Nina Vitoshek. You will hear from her in a moment. Here at the Bay, uh, the uh, uh, <coughs> organizers are the Center for Corporate Responsibility and a program now started up by the Research Council called the Afino Program on uh, Business and Society. Uh, so, that was a bit of the bureaucracy behind it. Um, before I hand over, I would like to say that from a business school perspective, it's very s sound to have something different from the American cooperative model, shareholder ownership, etc., etc., which is the very dominant paradigm in business school teaching. And I think in today's world, with uh, challenges to business to take social and environmental considerations really seriously into the business model, we need to think about alternatives, not to substitute it completely, but at least to have some more variety out there. And this is why I'm very happy to see this uh, taking place here at the business school. That said, I will hand over the uh, chairing of or the introduction of our guest to Professor Nina Vitoshek at the Center for Development and the Environment. <laughs> Please. Thank you. We've decided to change rooms, not just because there were more people coming than we expected, but also because you have a chance to be on television. And everybody wants to be on television these days. <laughs> so it, the, the, the seminar is going to be uh, televised. It's highly. Uh, informal, and that's why I would say that um, you know let, let's be let let, let let us be true. It's not a collaboration between the Center for Development and the Environment and the Business School. It's a mesalliance, my dear friends. <laughs> you know, and the mesalliances are, uh, as you know, uh, the specialty or where the specialty of the one of the greatest uh, uh, professors of philosophy in the Norwegian intellectual history, RNNS. RNNS loved mesalliances and he would be very happy to see the <laughs> philosophers and uh, uh, students of humanities and the business students gathered in one room and discussing uh, cooperative economy. Now, the second point I wanted to make is, uh, has to do with the background for this seminar. I actually came to know John Altuna through uh, evolutionary scientists, which is unlikely uh, source. Uh, there is some kind of. A I think it's, uh, it's it overlaps. Wait from the okay, very good. I should have got this technical remark slightly earlier. <laughs> so I, I I got to know the Mondragon people uh, via the uh, my collaboration. This time it was a Mesarians collaboration as well. This is wrong, Atle. <laughs> Adrian, can you help a bit? Uh, and um, the, uh, these evolutionary scientists represent the so-called third wave of evolution science. They claim that, um, uh, as uh, one of them put it, uh, selfishness beats uh, altruism within groups. But altruist groups beat selfish groups. Okay. So in other words, what these guys are saying, and I'm talking about the uh, evolutionary scientists, is that the altruist and cooperative groups have an advantage over the selfish groups because they're simply more resilient, they are more uh, creative, and they have uh, better adaptive skills. This is the evolutionary point of view. This, this is their, their approach. So, uh, of course, uh, the Scandinavians, especially the Norwegians, think that they are the most cooperative and altruist people on earth. And the, in this way, they massage the already high coefficient of national me megalomania. But uh, this is not the case. Uh, we are going to prove to you today that one of the most cooperative societies in Europe, at least, and the most interesting experiments in altruism and cooperation through and through, both in the institutions, in the 
uh, organization of knowledge and in the uh, businesses is in a small city uh, near Bilbao in, uh, in the Basque Land in Spain. And it's a great privilege to introduce to you John Altuna, who is going to unwrap the code of Mondragon's success as a cooperative society. And uh, I give the floor to you now because I think that uh, my two minutes are over. <laughs> So good morning, every everybody. Uh, thank you, Nina Atle, for for your kind introduction and invitation to to this seminar. I think uh, well, uh, Nina explained us the that the origin of this uh, of this seminar and also the visit from a delegation of uh, of some members from Mondragon to Norway, in particular, uh, came after a visit of some representatives from um, from Norway. Stein, Nina, and also Halvor uh, came to Mondragon last June, and uh, uh, and we thought that it might be interesting also to know uh, the Norwegian, uh, the, our Norwegian counterparts, and how Norway is facing also the glo uh, the new global challenges as a, as a society. My, my presentation will make a brief introduction about uh, uh, about Mondragon. Uh, I sent some material to uh, to Nina. The presentation is all, also available uh, to you, but there is a, a lot uh, written already about Mondragon, and I will just go briefly about that. And also, Nina asked me to uh, to talk a little bit about the challenges, okay? Because uh, one of the things that uh, people tend to when uh, when they visit Mondragon is to to, to believe that uh, Mondragon is a utopia. I mean, Dragon is not a utopia, it's an exper experience and it's a, an experiment with uh, its contradictions and, and its success stories, okay? And I hope we can we can also discuss about and, and talk a little bit about, about that. Well, the, the whole journey of uh, the creation of Mondragon Cooperative Group or experiment uh, dates back to 1940-41 when uh, Jose Maria Adif Mendigarreta a 25-year-old Catholic priest arrived in the town of Arrasat de Mondragon uh, back in 1941. Uh, he had to overcome dramatic uh, economic uh, circumstances after the civil war in Spain and a great uh, social division. Uh, he soon started to work with uh, young people, organizing all types of activities, sports, culture, but he primarily centered on education. In fact, in 1943, he created the first uh, technical uh, technical school, which is now the embryo of Mondragon University. Okay, uh, and uh, the basic idea was to democratize the access to technical vocational education, which was uh, only privileged to the elite in the in the community. Okay. Uh, but he not only took uh, action in education, he also took action in the fields of work, and that's how he, co he convinced also the first five graduates of the, of the technical vocational school to pursue engineering studies initially, and then in 1956 to create the first cooperative called Ulgor. It's, uh, it's true that uh, Aritmendi Arrieta's philosophy uh, had in the center that he believed that uh, cooperative action uh, based on self-organizing communities had a strong potential uh, to overcome somehow some of the conflicts that were arising in the 20th century. And those conflicts are uh, the conflict between capital and labor. Uh, and he strongly believed about the potential of cooperation to overcome that conflict, right? And uh, he also believed that uh, in order to develop uh, the individual and the community, there were like three elements which were necessary. It was uh, education, work, solidarity, and also participation. So that's uh, the foundations of, uh, of the Mondragon philosophy, as we can say it, which date back to the previous century, to the 20th century. But I think uh, the Mondragon foundations give us some clues also about uh, our future challenges as society. And we can, hopefully we can talk about that uh, later on as well. Uh, those, uh, the crisis that emerged uh, back in, in the previous century of two uh, different conceptions of uh, organizing economy and society, that is to say the, uh, the liberal and the socialist uh, paradigms, uh, were somehow challenged by, 
by the policy uh, possibility of cooperation to to overcome and produce uh, uh, benefit for for society and uh, also gives us some opportunities to rethink and be creative uh, uh, to see different formulas uh, for those uh, to challenge those problems beyond the the logic of public and private. There is also, I think, a, a broader paradigm uh, in in the Mondragon cooperative experience. It's not only centered in a, uh, in building a different structure uh, of companies, but I think there is a broader paradigm, and that paradigm is the creation of uh, self-organized uh, communities based on decision-making uh, subjects, uh, subjects who are able to make their own decisions. The mission of Mondragon uh, uh, somehow summarizes all these ideas about uh, the Mondragon philosophy, and, and uh, those are summarized, and, and, and the mission states that Mondragon is an entrepreneurial socioeconomic entity with deep cultural roots in the Basque Country, created by and for the people, inspired by the basic principles of our cooperative experience, committed to the community, to the improvement of competitiveness, and to the satisfaction of customers to create wealth within society through entrepreneurial development and job creation, preferably membership jobs in cooperatives. That's what the Mondragon mission states. The basic principles of uh, the Mondragon Cooperative experience, which are somehow very similar to the global cooperative principles, are uh, this ten that we have here. Open admission and neutrality, democratic organization, sovereignty of labor, instrumental and subordinate nature of capital, participatory management, wage solidarity, intercooperation, social transformation, universality, and education. Those are the 10 basic principles of, uh, of Mondragon. What are the rules to become a member of, uh, of Mondragon? Uh, we have uh, summarized some of the ideas here. And those are the rules that any cooperative and uh, free addition, free addition, addition uh, uh, the rules that any cooperative from Mondragon need to obey. First one, it's uh, the relocation among cooperatives of unemployed people, restructuring of results. Some parts of the, of the gross results of, of the cooperatives will be distributed between 15% to 40%, depending on the cooperative and the sector, will be distributed among the co-ops uh, uh, of the same sector or division. Yeah. There is also a common uh, corporate fund for investment and cooperatives need to also provide to, to that investment fund and, and some other uh, uh, some other funds that can be also distributed for, for the education purposes to to support uh, and aid uh, cooperatives in, the, in financial difficulties and so on and there is also some rules uh, regarding profit uh, distribution a uh, 10 percent needs to go to education fund and that's how in part uh, the university is funded uh, and other uh, cooperatives uh, school from Mondragon is, is funded. 60% uh, will go to the reserves of the, uh, of the cooperative, and 30% will be returned to, uh, as a profit to worker members. Okay? The initial contribution of uh, each member to, to a cooperative is of 15,000 euros, right? And that capital can be uh, increased in the case of... Uh, for profit cooperatives and will be increasing. Uh, the cooperatives will in turn uh, give uh, less than 7.5% of uh, interest rate uh, of that capital to the, uh, to the owner member. There is also uh, some rules uh, related to solidarity and compensation with a wage difference of one to six uh, with the lowest and highest paid uh, cooperative member. And also uh, the obligation to report data to, to Mondragon headquarters uh, monthly, economic data and social data. And, and finally, there's a rule for no internal competition, which is some, but sometimes it's difficult to, <laughs> to consider. Okay. 
uh, I think we can uh, see that uh, the cooperatives in Mondragon uh, are basically grouped in these uh, four basic uh, uh, business areas. Yeah. It's uh, finance, industry, distribution, and, and knowledge. Altogether, uh, we are 94 or 98 uh, cooperatives there, and 64 of them are industrial cooperatives. This is a distinctive feature of, uh, of Mondragon a cooperative experience, the amount of industrial cooperatives present in, in the whole ecosystem. Mondragon configures uh, the first cooperative industrial group in the world, as we know it, right? Uh, in terms of business, we represent we are the first business group in the Basque region and seventh in Spain, okay? But it's the main industrial cooperative industrial group in, in the world. Uh, a model that has been able to create wealth. And we see that uh, a turnover of the cooperatives uh, reach uh, 12 billion uh, euros. But I think there is much more uh, in, in the consideration of wealth as well in the cooperative model. Uh, apart from the turnover and the profits and, and et cetera, there is the conception uh, that uh, the cooperative should provide for better job uh, quality, uh, training, uh, and also health, health and security for workers. Uh, Mondragon is also composed of a very diverse set of cooperatives operating in very different uh, sectors, and it's also composed of, uh, of a variety of brands. Uh, we see some of the brands here, probably some of the brands are are not known uh, to you. Uh, probably one Orona might be uh, the elevation uh, manufacturer might be somehow uh, known here in Norway. But uh, I need to tell you that these brands are leaders uh, in the Spanish market in their respective uh, sectors. And some of them are, are also hidden champions worldwide, yeah? mainly in the component sector, but um, in the machine, machine tool industry, for instance. Well, it's, uh, it's true that probably all, uh, all of this wouldn't be possible if, uh, if there hadn't been uh, uh, the people at the center of the project and the commitment of ordinary people working in the co-ops every day, right? How do we achieve that commitment? I think uh, the high level of, uh, of commitments and identity that we achieve in, in the cooperative members are basically due to the to our own uh, participatory model. Okay, we worker members participate in ownership. Uh, we also participate in management, and we also participate in results. And through that mechanism, I think uh, we achieve a, a higher level of uh, of uh, commitment. There is also uh, a very important uh, focus on transparency. Uh, where uh, cooperatives report to their governing boards and also to the social boards monthly uh, the um, operations of the cooperatives and, and where they discuss the main issues about the cooperative monthly. So the information is available to cooperative members uh, quite, uh, quite substantially. There's also the issue of democratic participation, the election of governing board, uh, of the governing members uh, it's democratic, and the, the members uh, uh, elect their own representatives in, the, in their governing boards and the social boards. Uh, uh, just to give you a figure, at this moment, uh, 800 cooperative members will be uh, in governing boards. So it's a quite substantial amount of uh, members who are uh, in the everyday operations of, of the cooperatives. And there is also rules regarding uh, uh, payment and unequal uh, remuneration. So equal, uh, equal qualification uh, requires equal payment, no matter whether uh, gender issues and, or any, any other considerations. And as I said, there is also the rule uh, of a wage difference to one to six, which in the case of, uh, of the university, but in fact, is one, one to 4.5. And originally it was one to three. 
If the truth is that uh, there is also uh, behind this uh, big <laughs> conglomerate of uh, industrial cooperatives, banking cooperatives as well, uh, there is uh, also the commitment uh, to constantly uh, adapt to the necessities of, uh, of the, and the evolution of the economy and society and, and also innovation. And that's why Mondragon has established its own uh, innovation ecosystem with a cooperative university, Mondragon University, where, where, where we belong to. Uh, we have uh, the university, 15 research centers altogether, and also companies are part of this innovation ecosystem. The idea of uh, why Cooperative decided to create a, a university and why so many uh, research centers are part of it is that uh, uh, the focus is to create knowledge attached to the territory. Uh, the cooperatives would like to, that knowledge to be created in the territory and not to depend to, to foreign uh, knowledge providers to Okay, at one point you would need some experts and, and some technology that is not available in the territory, but the idea is to, to gen generate it uh, in that. To give you some figures, 44% uh, of the patents generated in the Basque Country are generated in Mondragon. Okay, and the investment in uh, R&D in the Mondragon region, in the town and the cities that <laughs> Stein and, and Nina also know it's uh, above 4%, which is well above the Basque region, Spain, and, and the average uh, in, uh, in Europe as well. There is also the issue of uh, innovative uh, cooperatives. Yeah? Uh, Mondragon Group has the highest percentage of innovative, innovative businesses uh, in the Basque region. And to give you a figure, 10% uh, of the uh, industrial turnovers come from new products and services. So that gives you an amount of, uh, of how, uh, uh, how fast and how uh, adaptation is also created. Well, uh, Montragon ha has probably shown uh, that it's possible to, to grow in a sustainable manner and, uh, and a much more equitable manner. Uh, by creating a competitive, uh, competitive businesses and uh, also cooperative territories. But uh, it's also true that, uh, that in the perspective of business, and uh, Atle was, was mentioning, I think, some of the ideas uh, earlier on, that we cannot understood, uh, understand nowadays uh, any business activity, in particular in the industrial sector, without uh, uh, considering an internationalization strategy, okay? And Mondragon has also been part of, uh, of that internationalization strategy. Uh, it's a very challenging issue, uh, the, how internationalization has been uh, aborted by, by Mondragon cooperatives. Uh, it's probably true that uh, cooperatives in Mondragon uh, went into an internationalization strategy in a very defensive manner, okay, no in a, an aggressive uh, in aggressive manner, okay. But all in all, uh, we need to also acknowledge that Mondragon has established uh, capitalist subsidiary models uh, whenever uh, they have uh, aborted uh, international internationalization strategies. Uh, we have some figures of uh, of cops present. Uh, Worldwide, uh, we are now in the five continents with 143 uh, subsidiaries, uh, but none of them, uh, no, none of them is a, is a cooperative. Okay, it's true that uh, Mondragon Coops, but not just Mondragon Coops, but other cooperative experiences worldwide uh, have not uh, adopted, uh, let's say, intercooperation strategies with other cooperative movements. Uh, international cooperative movements in these international strategies. When we come to, to think about the reasons of why uh, it's not, because the logic might, might think that uh, uh, the cooperative movement should establish the relationship between of intercooperation with uh, other companies, there are many issues that arise there. But it's a very challenging and, and conflicting issue. Okay, 
Some of them, uh, just to summarize, I will summarize five of them mm -hmm. to give you uh, some of the wisdoms that we internally have been discussing as well. The first one is that uh, commercial relations are created based on economic criteria. Mm -hmm. And that is the case of many cooperatives, for instance, uh, suppliers of, uh, of the big automotive uh, companies who, who had at one point to decide when their uh, main clients decided to to have establishments in, in Mexico, China, Eastern Europe, they had necessarily to uh, to move and, and set up, set up uh, set subsidiaries in those places where their main clients were were operating. So that's one of the of the reasons that have uh, have aroused. The other one is that the cooperative universe is very limited worldwide, and in particular, as we said, in the industrial sector, there are not many cooperative industrial ecosystems worldwide. So that's another barrier that uh, we have had some exper experiences in Brazil, for instance, but uh, it has been difficult to cooperate in terms of uh, intercooperations and the logic of, of market and commercials with other cooperative uh, movements in, uh, internationally. The third element is the, the different legal frameworks for co-ops worldwide. And we have to be honest, it's much more easier to establish uh, capitalist subsidiaries uh, than uh, cooperative rules. And not, uh, just to give you an example of uh, some reconversion of cooperatives, uh, of conventional capitalist companies in Spain, in regions in Spain, which have been reconverted to cooperatives, we have to uh, promote changes in the cooperative laws of the regions, of some regions in Spain. We cannot imagine uh, doing that in the Czech Republic or in Mexico. It's so complicated where, where the cooperative framework, the legal framework is so different. The other one, the fourth element is the cultural one. And that's, that's an important one as well. And when at one point, one cooperative in Brazil uh, proposed their uh, employers at that point to create a cooperative. And uh, when the, uh, the owners were challenged uh, to put 15,000 euros as an initial capital asset, they said, well, we don't want cooperative. Okay, and that's, that's a reality. And on top of that, there are some, uh, some countries with, with also uh, very important uh, state relations, where the state is very powerful, and uh, we need to acknowledge that uh, some states are very reluctant of organizations uh, which promote self-organization as well. Okay, and and the fifth one, and that's internal one as well, and we need to be honest about this one, is that if we were to uh, to establish uh, cooperatives uh, in our subsidiaries. We would over, uh, obviously uh, these cooperatives would need to experience the full sovereignty, and there is a real concern in in uh, Montragon cooperatives to lose control of the businesses and knowledge, and I think that makes also somehow uh, Montragon cooperatives a little bit reluctant, reluctant to to uh, to move forward on that sense as well. Well, so. This is just a part of uh, about about what is Montragon and and some of the successes and, and failures or not failures but the challenges of uh, and the conflicts of Montragon. Okay, and also Nina asked me about uh, what is Montragon looking to the future. Okay, so I will just state you uh, a few ideas that uh, came out of the of probably one of the biggest crises that Montragon. Uh, Corporation and Mondragon Cooperative Experience faced in 2013 with the downfall, some of you might, might know, with the downfall of the flagship cooperative, Fagor Electrodomesticos, let's say the mother of, of cooperatives in Mondragon, uh, with uh, 2,000 uh, cooperative members which were reallocated in, in the whole cooperative environment. But that was a real crisis in Mondragon. Okay, and that uh, through that uh, and the Congress that we, uh, we celebrated in 2015, there were like uh, emerged some some ideas to uh, to reinforce the 
the idea of the cooperative movement, okay? Uh, the basic uh, idea that came out of that is that we were probably facing a much more complex, much more global, uh, and much more uh, demanding uh, economic scenario worldwide. And that necessarily uh, the mandate to cooperatives was uh, to reinforce, uh, to reinforce uh, some of the of the values that cooperatives uh, will be facing. Uh, we need to be much more demanding uh, on the profitability and the results of the cooperatives. And we need to have much more sustainable and competitive uh, cooperatives to the future. And that was one of the strong uh, points that emerged in the, in the Congress. But there, all, there was also a challenge to Mondragon. Mondragon Corporation was established in 1991, right? And uh, we had an uh, organizational structure, but that was also a challenge to whether Mondragon as a group was, was necessary, right? And uh, in fact, we, we need to reinvent Mondragon for the future. And that was the, the other mandate of the, of the Congress, to reinvent Mondragon for the future. And we had to find a shared project a shared project that would definitely be very pragmatic and very supportive of the real needs of cops. Otherwise, the cops uh, will will see uh, see cops abandoning uh, Mondragon. Okay, so there is also a mandate uh, to reinforce Mondragon for the future. And uh, through that mandate, uh, there were like three basic lines of action that I will just briefly state. The first of one is uh, to live or live in the cooperative values. The second one is to rethink our organizational structure. And the third one is to, uh, to also think about a new fund, a funding and financial structure for intercooperation. Those are the three lines of action uh, which emerged from the last uh, uh, Congress. First of all, values, right? So it's true that uh, uh, the history uh, of Mondragon uh, brought us to this reality, uh, basically uh, because we had some very core, important core values of democracy, solidarity, participation, and, uh, and cooperation. And because Mondragon has been uh, very agile in joining these values, with making co-ops profitable and economically efficient as well. So this combination is very important. And we also articulated some very interesting solidarity and intercooperation mechanisms. And that uh, has allowed us, allow us to, to be here. So we don't want to abandon these uh, values. We want to at least reinforce and reinterpret some of them and, and strengthen some of these values too. Uh, the first element uh, on these core values is the reinforcement uh, or to put emphasis in two ideas. One is of uh, the idea of self-demand self uh, on the cooperative, not on the cooperative, on the cooperative members and each cooperative, okay, and co-responsibility. Those are two of the ideas that, uh, that we want to, to strengthen. And the second one is responsible solidarity because we acknowledge that we had somehow some uh, very patronizing sometimes uh, solidarity schemes that uh, brought us to very difficult economic situations, and that is the case for, uh, in, some ca uh, in some cases of our electrodomesticos. Okay, so we need to, uh, to reinvent this uh, new solidarity, responsible solidarity scheme, okay? Uh, well, what we want is to transform difficult situations in cooperatives and not perpetuate uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, situations in cooperatives. But also there is uh, a mandate to cooperatives receiving uh, aid or financial support in, dif in difficult situations. Those cooperatives will need, at least at the very beginning, prior to receiving any aid or support, financial support, uh, to put forward some self-demanding uh, initiatives. So that's 
previous to receive any funding, you need to put forward some uh, uh, some self-demanding uh, initiatives uh, uh, before that. But also there is a, a mandate to cooperatives uh, providing financial uh, uh, financial assistance, uh, assistance to other cops, because they don't do that just uh, in order to uh, for social or so solidarity principles. Uh, they need to think about that uh, in terms also of, of business perspective, and these ideas need to be uh, reinforced. It's obviously the intercooperation. It's probably one of the differential factors uh, in in the history uh, of co-ops and uh, we want to intensify uh, intercooperation in this new this new area we believe that it's uh, intercooperation is a differential factor both in terms of solidarity but gives us also differential factor uh, in business terms okay and we want to reinforce that some of the mechanisms of intercooperation that we have established in Mondragon are the reconversion of results, as we, we have shown uh, earlier. The corporate financial mechanism are other uh, financial terms. Common platforms, for instance, we have common platforms for purchasing uh, to create new businesses, uh, for training and education, mm -hmm. and for health and, and security as well uh, for, for worker members. We have also established community of practices so that uh, co-ops can, uh, can show uh, good practices and learn from good practices of other co-ops and, and not just co-ops but other, other organizations worldwide as well. And, and also the relocation, uh, uh, the relocation of unemployed uh, members is, is another very strong and powerful intercooperation. All in all, I think uh, Mondragon has created a, an ecosystem which has shown to be a very resilient to the economic cycles. And just uh, finally, uh, in this line of action of values, there is also a mandate uh, to reinforce our uh, social transformation uh, mission, the mission of social transformation. Okay, And uh, basically, in one uh, very clear idea, in the idea of legacy, okay, on... Uh, uh, on working on business projects which are much more uh, sustainable for the future uh, generations. And that's the idea behind uh, the social responsibility. The second line of action is related to the organizational structure. Okay? When Montragon Corporation was created, uh, there was a, the cooperatives were grouped in divisions, uh, uh, divisions of cooperatives operating in the same or similar sectors, okay? And uh, it's true that uh, probably we want to maintain that divisional organization, okay? But we need to rethink what is strengthen other uh, organizational structures and basically the regional structures uh, in order to, to reinforce the social transformation mission. We need to uh, think that the original organizational structure of COPS was regional before Mondragon Corporation was created. And then we somehow, in most cases, abandoned the regional organizations of, of COPS, adopted the divisional one, and I think we need to, to go back and, and also uh, reinforce the, the, uh, the regional organization of COPS. Uh, yeah, basically, that's the main idea. You also saw that Mondragon is uh, composed of a very diverse set of, of co uh, cooperatives, uh, very heterogeneous in their sectors and divisions and sizes and, and so on. And that uh, uh, makes us believe that Mondragon needs to be very flexible and agile also in, in supporting this diversity uh, of cops. And we want to keep that diversity because that diversity is another element that has uh, shown uh, that has allowed us to be much more resilient, okay? Just to give you an idea, we have like uh, four different scenarios of COPs in, in Mondragon. Uh, we have like a small amount of, of consolidated uh, cooperatives, mm, normally of certain size, uh, which are uh, uh, doing extremely well, uh, really well. 
we have a, a large amount of healthy co-ops uh, with huge growth potential. We have a small amount of, of co-ops uh, having real difficulties, uh, uh, which will need support uh, from Mondragon. And also we have some uh, businesses with uh, growth potential, okay, which will probably need support as well from, from Mondragon. So the whole organizational structure needs to respond to this diversity as well. And just finally, uh, the third line of action is the line of action of, uh, of funds, uh, funds and financial infrastructure for, for intercooperation. Throughout this year, we have established uh, mechanisms for, uh, 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 for financial intercooperation, and that uh, is the case, for instance, for uh, the Mondragon uh, Corporate Fund for, for Investment. Okay, but uh, it's true that uh, for this new area, we need to also think about the different uh, uh, financial schemes, uh, schemes uh, for intercooperation, and basically with two objectives. The one, the first one, is to strengthen the competitive uh, position of of cooperatives, and the second one is to to, uh, to contribute to the promotion of of their business projects, of new business projects, because we were very agile and very uh, dynamic in generating new businesses back in the 80s, and we are no longer so, so dynamic in, in this new era. And uh, the cool idea uh, to the future also points to strategic areas of, uh, of business. And the strategic areas of business are those that uh, have been uh, uh, defined here. It's the automotive sector sustainable energy and smart cities, the infrastructure and construction, health and well-being, uh, capital, uh, human capital, developing uh, human capital, uh, home solutions, and, and finally, equipment and manufacturing assets. Those are the, the main areas for, for the future. So that's about my presentation. It's true that probably the global uh, challenges that uh, we are all facing as societies and the, the neoliberal economic model that is imposed uh, worldwide nowadays uh, uh, challenges uh, all of us uh, to be creative in, uh, in having in, in rethinking new solutions. Probably self-organization, uh, cooperativism can give us some clues, but on the contrary, I think the whole cooperative movement and Mondragon cooperative experience also has some man, many challenges that arise from our own uh, history and experience. So we will be happy just to discuss about uh, all these issues. We are celebrating a Congress in June, the next Congress, cooperative Congress, where all cooperative cooperatives uh, will join, uh, will be celebrated in June. We are now discussing in every one of the cooperatives we are discussing and the basic document of the Mondragon of the future. And just to advance you some of the ideas, uh, there is a, a clear, uh, for the first time, there's a clear uh, mandate and line of action on sustainability, mm -hmm. uh, on digitalization, and on flexible businesses. Those are three of the many other elements that will be discussed in June. So thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I will be happy just to respond to any question.